Hello and welcome to the Empress Podcast. I am your host, Jessica, known in the online space as Jess the Empress. I started this podcast to help you be present with yourself, cope with chaos, and simplify your life. I do this by combining psychology, behavioral science, and the tarot. I have a background in mental health, specifically a master's in clinical social work from USC, and I'm a professional tarot reader. So get ready to have a nurturing, creative, and empowering experience with me as we use practical magic. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the episode. I have a guest here. I am introing, and I'm so excited for you to meet her. She's amazing, and her name is Megan. She is an erotic money coach and the owner of Sacred Numbers. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself by kicking us off with what are your three signs, your big three in the Zodiac? Oh, we see a puppy in the background. Is it a cat? It's a cat. It's a cat. Hi, <laughs> meow, meow. Toro's yeah, right behind yeah. me. You guys can't see him, but he's back there. <laughs> He'll be there the whole call. That's so, so. cute. We love it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Megan. I am a Libra sun, Leo moon, and Gemini rising. Um, and I'm super excited to be here chatting with you, Jess. I'm so happy to have you. So how long have we known each other? Like quite a while. Yeah, I think it's been at least three years, if not four. Yeah, and we met on Instagram, <laughs> the place where so many people meet. Yeah, it's crazy because I think I purchased, I mean, I purchased several readings from you and we've kind of done some back and forth services. I've helped you with yeah. some finance stuff and mm-hmm. like profit first and stuff like that. So yeah, love having you in my world. Same. Yeah. I like the exchange of services and it's always a pleasure to read for you. And just like seeing our change over time is like, I was kind of reflecting on that before we hopped on. And I'm like, even in like the three years that we've known each other or a little bit longer than three years, like we've gone through a lot of transformation. Yeah. The way that we've like marketed ourselves, obviously that comes from like who we are as a person and then wanting to like, you know, fairly represent that online to everybody else. But isn't that crazy to think about like the the amount of change over the last just few years. Yeah, it's crazy. I think we've definitely both stepped a lot more into our authentic, like unapologetic, witchy, like, uh, you know, hail Satan selves. Absolutely. And And you like inspire me a lot. I actually bought a, um, one of, uh, the last, last podcast on the left there, Tumblr that says hell Satan on it. I I, um, love that one. I wanted to get, I think you got like socks or something that said hell Satan or something else that, um, but they were like out of it. So I was like, all right, I'll go with the Tumblr. Yeah. LP, you got to snatch their stuff up real quick. Make sure you get on their like, um, newsletter list. So that way you can like know when the new thing comes out, but I have one of their mugs, or two of their mugs. And I then I think have it was the coffee cup that I wore. Yeah. And then I have like their playing cards. I have like a shirt, like I love their merch. So <laughs> I'm all for it, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. And I think that too, is like, we're, we're stepping in more to like our just, yeah, the goddess that doesn't give a fuck vibe, which is, you know, I think the best <laughs> energy to represent in the world today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So erotic money coach, I'm sure people's eyes are like, what does that even mean? So can you (laughs) tell us what does an erotic money coach do or you specifically as an erotic money coach, what do you do? Yeah. So I help my clients turn up and turn on their relationship with money and we use eroticism. We use pleasure. We use ritual, breath work, somatics, um, you know, normal kind of like question and answer type coaching, as well as like systems and organizational stuff, because my background is in finance. So you won't find me without, you know, you won't find me in the full woo. Like we're going to be doing some systems and processes as well, Mm -hmm. because that's just who I am. I got to bridge the two. So yeah. yeah, I think that's also where we both align of making the woo more tangible for people, because I think a lot of people struggle. They think they have to be one or the other, and they have a hard time holding both. But you and I both know that 
we're here on earth. So numbers are like a part of it. Spreadsheets are a part Mm -hmm. of it. Being practical, sitting down and like doing kind of boring things is a part of it, but that doesn't mean that it has to be horrible or that we still can't hold space for magic happening in the middle of all the, you know, the stuff we just got to do kind of thing. Yeah. There's definitely space for magic in the mundane. Mm -hmm. And I like to see it as like my cunning CEO. Who's I love that got her finger on the pulse of like everything going on in her business. She delegates, she's in her spreadsheets. She knows the numbers, like, you know, she is like the, the one making the moves on the chessboard kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay. So you're helping people have a better relationship with their money. You're helping them just feel like more confident with their money and, and their connection to money. But what would a session look like with you? Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So at the beginning of every session, we always do some sacred brags. I want you to take up space. So you're going to go on for five or 10 or 15 minutes, however long it takes you to get out all of your brags and tell me everything amazing that's happening in your life. And then we're going to move into what feels alive for you uh, on that day. So that could be, you know, I'm feeling extremely anxious about this bill coming up. I don't know how I'm going to pay it. Or we'll move into... My parents have been telling me that I don't have a real job, that I need to like, you know, get a nine to five, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll figure out exactly what the feelings are there. Spend a few minutes grounding into accepting and acknowledging those feelings, because the biggest thing in my practice is that we don't spiritually bypass. We're not Mm going to like shove down any of the emotions. All emotions are like valid and accepted Mm -hmm. in our world and so after we do that we might do a little ritual a self-pleasure or like listen to some music and ground into the identity that you want to hold that's cool instead of like feeling like you're out of control or kind of chaotic which we love a chaotic vibe but we want it to be intentional (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) And then we usually wrap up the session with some takeaways and a body body check in, and um, we'll we'll wrap up and talk in Telegram afterward. Okay, cool. Oh, that's really sweet. So they get a lot of you in the session. It sounds like you're very present and you're very nurturing, which I love. I think that's so important. And um, you were talking about somatics, so we're we're touching on the nervous system, right? In this mm-hmm. context. So what are you doing to help with the nervous system um, and regulating it for people? Yeah. So a lot of times your nervous system, anything that's unknown, even if it's better for you, you know, the subconscious tends to send off these alarm bells of like, okay, we don't know what's on the other side of this. So Mm -hmm. we are going to raise all the red flags and your body goes into like either, you know, freeze, fight fawn or um, whatever it it may be. And with the practices that I give my clients, we're focusing on our breathing. We're focusing on our five senses to kind of bring ourselves from mind back Mm -hmm. into body Mm -hmm. so that we're not just like freaking out, spinning our wheels, like, you know, like going a million miles a minute. And we're able to connect back into the body and figure out, okay, what is this reaction trying to tell me? Obviously I feel unsafe. Obviously I feel like there's a threat. So how can I create some inner safety in the body to go at this in a controlled and like aware point of view. Right. Yeah. I love that because without the feeling of safety internally, it's going to be very difficult to get to anything else, right? Any of those next steps that you want people to be mastering, it's going to be very difficult for them to tap into that and execute it because they're freaked out internally. So creating an internal sense of safety is is so important. I love that. I love that you're walking through that with people. And does it look different for every client or do you have a specific um, like meditation that you guide people through or practice or like what's the vibe there? 
it is different for a lot of people because a lot of times people just need to get to neutral. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're not even working on like a positive, uplifting Mm -hmm. relationship with money. We're just going from like, I am fucking scared and anxious right now and I just need to get to like neutral. Yeah. So and and from there some people are going from a neutral place to an to an erotic and like turned on place so the practices are about the same as far as like we're listening to music we're connecting to the body and breath and senses but depending on where they are on the spectrum of like you know anxious neutral or like erotic Mm -hmm. we are working on different identities, I would say different archetypes. Cool. Yeah. I love that. That's amazing. So why do we need to regulate the nervous system aside from like safety? What else? And when it comes to money, does it, why is it important? Like, what do people need to know? Yeah. Well, you may know that as you sit and check your bank account, you might feel extremely triggered and anxious and spiked and charged so in order to get anything done in order to make room to make more money to spend more money to do anything um actionable with your money you have to bring yourself into a state of calm neutrality if not turned on in order to because it's when we're in a state of freeze response or flight response or whatever it is you're not thinking clearly you're gonna do whatever that first intuition that first instinct is and a lot of times that's like okay you're in whole foods and you just put a bunch of groceries on the belt and it's two hundred dollars and you didn't realize it was gonna be two hundred dollars and you just shut down you go completely blank you swipe your card you get to the car and you're like what the fuck just happened Mm -hmm. and so in order to avoid that, like, what the fuck just happened feeling, we have to regulate, we have to come down into a neutral space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you also working on creating like actionable plans with people? Cause let's say like they've been in a habit of just like, I go to the grocery store. Yeah. I've put everything on there. It's $200. I'm like low key freaking out, but I can't say anything. I smile, swipe my card. I get in the car and I'm like, ah, having a meltdown. Are you working on like an action plan to maybe like, what would you say in that, in that instance of like, what might be an alternative action step that they could take instead of freezing and, or whatever that is. And then just like swiping the card or what, what would you do? Yeah. So working on the actual bringing pleasure into your everyday Mm -hmm. and dealing with money is going to, because we're working on replacing that in or unconscious reaction of Mm -hmm. like shutting down and moving through to replacing it with an awareness Mm -hmm. so that you don't have to shut down and a, and a, a safety in the body. So Yeah, as we, as I identify, okay, what are their patterns? What are their habits? We slowly take those habits and like tweak them Mm -hmm. and replace them with more sustainable, healthy habits. I love that. Um, Do you find that sometimes it's actually like the right action to do, but the narrative needs to change in the moment? I find that to be the case with some clients. And I'm curious if that also pops up, like, they can absolutely, like you've gone through their money. You can absolutely, they can absolutely afford a $200 grocery run to Whole Foods several times a week. So there's no real perceived reason why they would be having this, but it's sort of like the way that they're perceiving it. It's like attached to something that happened in their past or whatever. And they need to change their narrative about what they're doing, but the actions don't need to change. Like everything is fine. You know what I mean? Right. So I'll use the example of like, saying no to something so deciding that you don't want to spend money on something there could be the motivation of like I don't have the money for that I can't afford it like all of the scarcity reasons like there's no way that I can pull this out of my ass like Mm -hmm. I don't I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go on that trip because I'm terrified I'm not gonna make my bills next month okay versus having the motivation of like I have other priorities on my mind. I choose not to go on this trip or I choose Mm -hmm. not to invest in this um, 
event or coaching program or whatever it may be from a much more controlled and like that cunning CEO type archetype right. instead of being terrified and yeah. stressed out and anxious. It's the same outcome. You're not going on the thing. You're not doing the thing. Right. It's a different motivation. I love that. Oh, that's so great. So you started, like I said, three years ago when I met you, you were not an erotic money coach. You were just doing like a bookkeeping and you were like a, a money coach for people, but it wasn't in this same realm. So can you tell us about your story and how you also then transitioned into who you are today? Yeah. So I've been in finance for over a decade. I worked, I've worked for several small businesses. I worked in Manhattan for a CPA firm. You know, I felt like a big boss bitch, like walking around Manhattan, like going to my CPA job and like, it was fine, but the most unhappy people I've ever met with their money were working at that CPA firm. Wow. And I just, and talk about like toxic overworking, like toxic uh, pro productivity habits of like, I don't deserve to go home until I finish this amount of work or like, uh, huh. like working crazy hours, like 60 hour weeks during tax season. I mean, it's just like the tax industry is crazy. So once I got fired from that job, which was such a blessing, yeah, <laughs> my partner and I had this conversation of like, okay, well, I can either find another job, which I was confident that I could do. I've been bookkeeping for seven years at that point. So, mm -hmm. or I could do my own thing. And he was like, well, why don't you do your own thing? And so I started doing bookkeeping and CFO work for spiritual entrepreneurs. And I think that's even how we got connected because I yeah. DM'd you and was like, hey, <laughs> yeah. do you need services? Like, do you need bookkeeping? Um. And so I did that for a couple of years and really fell in love with the mentorship side of everything and helping people break through their upper limits and like helping people break down anxieties and desires and like figuring out what their actual goals were for their business and not just like monetary goals. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like we have a, a un, unbalanced focus on the fact that monetary goals should be your only goal posts in right. business. Yeah. Um, and from there, when I got into sex work and when I started embracing my own kink, kinky side, I decided that I got, I get to be erotic and I get to be pleasure focused. And mm -hmm. so I started incorporating it more and more into my money coaching. And here we are today. It's probably going to get even more naughty and freaky from here. <laughs> Love it. I'm so here for it. I remember some of the exercises that we did and they were really helpful. The way that you were asking me to visualize certain things and consider certain things and to reframe was all really helpful and stuff that I still end up using today. So, I mean, you guys, it's a I plug to get a session from her, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I'm so glad you are still using some yeah. of the tools today. And I, that means a lot to me too, because I know that you're like in the self-development space and like mm -hmm. you are also have a, your master's in psychology, right? Social work. Yeah. But clinical psychology, clinical social work, it's like similar. <laughs> yeah. So like you, you've, you are in the space, like, you know, like how to deal with your own shit a lot. So I, I love yeah. that. It's nice to have an outside perspective, I think, because sometimes you hear your own voice so many times. And even if you've mm -hmm. said something that I already know, hearing it outside myself is really helpful. I don't know. I'm like that type of person. I, there's a lot of people out there that are similar. It's yeah. like, you know something, but just hearing it confirmed from someone who doesn't necessarily know all the ins and outs of your day-to-day -day life, but then can just kind of reflect and you're like, okay, yeah, like... Yeah. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> like it's helpful. So yeah. now going into sex work and erotic money coaching, I'm sure that that's changed people's perspectives of you. So can you tell us how some people are looking at you differently now from like when you first started? And before we go into that, I just want to say to the audience that 
I do have a lot of sex worker clients and they're like my favorite people. Honestly, I love absolutely working with anybody in that industry. And I believe that there is unfortunately a lot of stigma around sex work and sex work can be anything from literally selling like a picture of your foot (laughs) to somebody who has a fetish to the most extreme things. Like I think we would consider maybe like BDSM or like live porn or whatever. And so I am not a person who's here to shame. I am genuinely curious, but I know that there are lots of people who, um, they feel shameful, I think for being in the sex industry or they don't understand sex work and they just immediately demonize it. So hopefully you can kind of give us some different perspectives to see today with being in the sex work industry. Yeah. If you want a, like, I deserve to be paid for just existing type of like um, perspective, go to sex work Twitter. Like it is the, the, the place to be where people are just like, have no shame around asking for money and like being well paid and well fucked is like the whole vibe of like sex work Twitter. And I I love love that. that space. Yeah. So I am a financial dominatrix. I also cater to a lot of fetishes as far as like, um, like tease and denial and like, uh, of course I'm completely blanking on everything on, on the spot. There's a lot of things. Like, it's all good. Yeah. There's a lot of things. I have a whole profile, but anyway, um, I, so there is money involved in my sex work as well and in my kink. So it was a lot to to separate my sex work from my quote-unquote vanilla work Mm -hmm. but at the same time it was a lot to be able to combine and meld those two aspects of myself into what I like to call an erotic money coach and Mm -hmm. so my kink education and my fetish lifestyle is very much informed into my erotic money coach and we use money coaching and we use kink and we use domination and submission and all of that kind of stuff within the coaching uh, containers that I offer. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, So that's going to be the right fit for certain people, not everybody, but um, like anything, there's good and clear communication that needs to happen it's, there's no one taking advantage of anyone. Everybody is fully on board and fully aware, consenting of what is going on. Um, Findom is amazing. I think that's like so freaking cool. So I love that that's like part of what you do. Um, so yeah, what, what sparked this transition? You said getting fired, but like before that, what, what really, you had a conversation with your hubs and, but like all those other things, I'm sure kind of led up to this transition and saying like, yes, I'm going to do this. So can you tell us a little bit more about that divine intervention of <laughs> having to leave the nine to five corporate America? Yeah. So it's funny that you say that. Cause I had actually started taking on freelance clients before I'd even gotten fired oh okay and so I had I was having this internal like war within myself between like okay how many clients do I need to have before I can quit how many how much money do I need to be making before I can quit and I was getting to the point where I had several like consistent well-paying clients and the universe was just like you know what we're going to take this decision off of your plate. (laughs) And actually I was, I was reading for myself at the time and was pulling the tower constantly. Oh, fun. And so I I just knew something was coming. And of course I wasn't willing to like step off the ledge myself. (laughs) So the universe was like, all right, we're just going to kick you out of the nest. And here we go. The lightning strike. Yeah, exactly. But even before that, like I had started my spiritual journey probably at age 20. I'm 30 now. Okay. And so I had been building up and it's one of those things where you just learn and relearn yourself over and over and over again. And like, Mm -hmm. like you were saying, even if it's something that you know, about yourself and know internally and you hear it from someone else it's like an epiphany all over again Mm -hmm. you're like oh wait I knew that and so 
that had a huge influence on the decision to just do my own thing. That's so cool. Yeah. You've been guided definitely in a lot of ways to be where you're at and in service. That's so cool. What is a, what does a day in the life look for, look like for you? Not just with clients, but your whole lifestyle. What is can you run us through that? Yeah. So I usually wake up and immediately check my phone. Mm -hmm. I have very, very few boundaries with uh, social media and stuff like that, but I'm checking my like fat life. I'm checking my sex work discord, my um, Twitter, my sex work Twitter and all of that in the mornings. And if I don't have anything to respond to or like, I'll take care of it within that first hour or so in the morning. And then I'm um, moving to making my smoothie or going to the gym. I'm a member at Lifetime Fitness and it's like the most amazing spa, like gym combo. And I feel healthy, like just parking in the parking lot. Like I am like a green goddess, just like pulling up into the parking lot, even if I just go in and like work. So anyway, it's one of my favorite places to go. I love this. And then I'll come home, probably post on, on Instagram, write an email, jump into all my networking groups. I usually, these days I have two to three calls a day. Um, as far as like networking calls, podcast interviews and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. and then I'm usually done by like two or three o'clock at clock. I might play the Sims and then my hub's husband gets home from working at the farm and we hang out and might go to the pool and yeah, super so love my life. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You're really just like flowing. You got the cat, one cat or two cats. I've got three cats. Three. Okay. I was like, I thought there were multiples. Yeah. Full-time cat mom. Oh, the dream. I wish I could have them. I'm allergic, but. So is my husband. Oh, is he okay? (laughs) He's fine. He's got an inhaler. He takes medication. Oh my God. I love him. Yeah. Right now I just have Toro. I think my goal, my goal at some point is to have an outdoor cat when I settle somewhere and I can be like available for them to be around. Cause at this point I travel too much and I just, I travel with Toro, which is amazing, but I don't know about traveling like with a cat that I wouldn't be around to feed all the time. And I just kind of want to be like fully available. Um, Okay. Going back to our, our questions. Well, once these cats are gone, there will be no more cats. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, we love them. But like you said, like we just travel too much and like, it's a whole other, a whole ass expense to like deal with people taking care of the cats or like boarding them or having a sitter. Yep. And if we have three, it's like three times that. (laughs) Oh, that's so true. I never thought about that. Yeah. Oh girl. I, yeah. I just enjoy like the freedom of like, no, no one else to have to take care of. Right. We get it. We love them though. So what are some of the tools that you're working with, witchy, non-witchy, um, when it comes to like staying balanced and on top of your game? Cause still, whether or not you're getting on social media first thing in the morning or a lot, you have a lot of things that you're doing and being present for and people you're coaching. So how do you, how do you even manage all that? Yeah. It comes with creating habits, I would say. And having the things that I normally do be a habit in my life so that my nervous system is not constantly knocked off its axis. Mm-hmm. And so I rarely, even though I am a manifesting generator, I rarely introduce new things into my daily routine. I mean, don't get it twisted. I don't have a routine like, you know, 8 a.m. brush teeth, 8.30, mm-hmm. like, you know, like nothing like that. But like, I do about the same things every day. So consistency and like predictability are really important to my nervous system. And that's something, a a huge tool that I use in my life, as well as I love my baths Mm -hmm. are an amazing place for me to connect to myself and to my money. And I started reading smut, like fiction books again, Yes, (laughs) which I haven't read in years. Like I've been 
you know, everything that we tend to listen to as entrepreneurs is usually like self-development focused or like Mm -hmm. business focused. So the podcasts I listen to, the books that I read are all very self-development focused. And I just was sick of it. And so I decided to start reading fiction again. And it's been like the best thing for my mental health. Yeah, absolutely. I've been in, um, I'm in Dune right now. I'm in the last, I'm in Chapter House, which is the last book of the Dune series, which is great. Verity was the last smut book that I read, which was awesome. Um, Yeah, I love all that. I love to just get away from my reality and just somebody else's and I can just disappear from here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. it's like all about that balance. Yeah, I love that. Oh, we have to talk about our smut books later. We'll do that off air. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So yeah, baths, reading, <laughs> consistency, predictability, also fucking off to the pool when I'm like yeah. at like noon and I'm just like, I can't focus. I can't like a lot of permission to just like a lot of permission mm-hmm. to do whatever I want to do. Like mm-hmm. my whole goal in this life is to be a lazy pleasure hedonist and so like I'm building my business around that goal and so if I'm not being a lazy hedonist then like yeah then I'm it's not, not working goal. right exactly <laughs> totally and I want to backtrack for just a moment you said manifesting generator for those of you who are unfamiliar with human design that is where that phrase comes from it is a, a simply another tool that you can use to um, kind of look at yourself. It's an interesting way to see parts of you. It may or may not be helpful, um, but I am also a manifesting generator according to the human design graph chart thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I had a whole, um, a human design reader on my podcast and she was super helpful. And like, I've had readings before. It's just another way to it's based on your birth chart. So if you are interested in astrology, you might also be interested in human design as well. It's just, like yeah, they overlap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I may have found, um, maybe I'll get somebody to come on here. So tools that you give your clients, what are you giving them? What are you setting them up with on the weekly, monthly, daily? Yeah. That, it's very unique to each client. Mm-hmm. Like, Currently, I have a client who just got her first car ever at like 26. And so she's like living her 16 year old like dream right now. She's got, you know, air freshener and beads and like, you know, decking out the inside of her car with like lights and stuff like that. Yeah, just like, like feeding her inner child. And we call it her money mobile. And she loves to take drives and like go to the beach. And that's how she connects to money right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's her main ritual. And so that's just one of the examples that like I, how I help my clients create unique practices for themselves. I love that. I love that it's tailored to the individual. I think so much of what we see online on social media is generalized. And I and there's a strategy behind that. There's a marketing strategy. The more general it is, the more people are going to say, oh my gosh, tr- sort of trigger something in them and then have them follow and like and all the things. But that you are tailoring to the individual, I think is important and not just giving them some like, here you go, do this like other thing that everyone else is doing. Yeah. That's important. Yeah, so we we talk a lot about unique practices that can help but we also do like I said you can't replace tapping into breath and body like Mm -hmm. every single person I work with we connect to the breath we connect to pussy or genitals or whatever it is and Mm -hmm. connect to that life force energy that every single person on this earth has access to Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're working with like the lower, the lower chakras. Mm-hmm. Hell yep. yeah, sacral root chakra, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's that safety and creative power. I love this. So, um, earlier we had mentioned money as a relationship to us, but can you expand more on that? What do you mean by that? Yeah. I think a lot of us are taught that money is a tool that we should separate ourselves as as far as we possibly can from money that we shouldn't Mm. identify too much with money Mm. that it's dangerous and all of that can be useful to some people 
I'm not here to say that like my way is the best way or anything like that, but I find that when I talk to my clients about money being a relationship and how, you know, how would you treat it if it were literally your partner or your best friend, they start to realize that like maybe they've been the toxic one or like maybe <laughs> they haven't created the proper or the safest um, environment for money to play and hang out with them. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been bad mouthing money their whole lives. And like, how would your best friend feel if they found out that you've been shitting on them to yeah. all the other friends, right? I love that perspective. Yeah. It's like a very quick, like, oh shit. So if you're listening and you've been bad mouthing your money, Megan <laughs> says you need to turn that around, turn that attitude around, <laughs> welcome it in. Yeah. yeah welcome it in. And also like, you know, no judgment, like we're not here to like, um, say that you've been a terrible person or anything like that. Like the good thing about money being an inanimate object is that like, it's a, it's a safe way to kind of work on your relationship skills. In yeah, opinion. absolutely. I love that too. And also, again, going back to your other points of the safety of creating safety of recognizing like you have a role to play in your money management because someone has mm -hmm. to manage the money. It doesn't manage itself. You are the manager. So if you're a, if you're like a manager, who's like, yeah, crappy, <laughs> then like, that's what your money relationship is going to be. It's going to be crappy. So you need to do the, again, if you're the toxic one, you need to do the self-improvement but then you have an easier relationship. You can at least go to neutral and see what yeah. can happen from there. And I love that. So when you're working with clients, I'm sure that you hear a lot of objections and a lot of like what ifs and I don't knows and all of that. Can you give us an example or several examples of the biggest um, obstacles that your clients overcome by working with you? Yeah. One of my favorites to work on with folks is that money is evil or like money mm -hmm. is spiritual to, to receive, or like, you know, if you're, if you do God's work or whatever, if you're a spiritual practitioner that like, you have to live some sort of like monk lifestyle in the Himalayas mm -hmm. and you can't be well-paid. Okay. And I just love untangling that with people and allowing helping them to unapologetically feel their desires like when you can connect to your desires on like a I get to be the bad girl I get to be the like unhindered unhinged like I get to want my desires freely and wildly they just, they just come so much deeper into themselves. And like, when you can untangle the judgment from the desires that you hold, your life becomes so much more divine. Mm -hmm. And like, I believe that de desires are divine. Mm -hmm. And if you have a desire for something that it came from God, source, spirit, whoever, and that you're meant to have that thing. So like, in my opinion, and in the way that I coach people, we work on integrating and embodying our desires. I love fully. that. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like, yeah, you're just getting people closer to the things that they, they want. And, and instead of that, because I think to your point, people are so dismissive of their desires because their desires are either too ridiculous or maybe they think they're too small. They shouldn't have them because there's been some cultural conditioning around what a good desire is or what a bad desire is. And it sounds like you're, yeah, uncording all of that for them and then being like, yeah, this is your desire. You want it. Stop making stories up about why you don't want it and claim it, damn it. <laughs> yeah. I'm loving claim it. Claim it deeply. And like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there around like shame and distrust of mm -hmm. self in like, even, okay, if I do claim this desire, that means that like, I have to actually try to get it too. Mm -hmm. And like, I have to actually put my energy behind it. 
and for a lot of people who are in survival mode that's like that just the act of trying to get to their desires when they're trying to survive is way too much energy for them to mm-hmm. expend yeah Right. So that's where, the, again, the nervous system regulation would be to mm-hmm. get them to a neutral place and then build up the stamina to hold getting behind what they want and putting effort consistently toward it. So I love yeah. the journey that you're taking people on. Oh, so amazing. So we're going to wrap up. And as we do, can you share some resources for listeners? If they want to get started on their own, what's the vibe? What do they need to look into? Yeah. So I always recommend... Profit First by Mike McCall- Mike McCallowitz uh, for the brain candy, for the processes, for the systems side of you. Then there's um, The Source is a book by Dr. Tara Swart. It's about the brain and the its role in like manifesting and creating the desires in reality that you mm-hmm. the, like taking them from you know, subconscious into reality. Mm -hmm. And I also would recommend You Are the Placebo by Dr. Joe Dispenza. He was, it's incredible, that book. He was in a bicycling accident and completely broke every vertebra in his spine Mm -hmm. and like made a full recovery. And he can tell you that story in the book, but I highly recommend that book. Mm -hmm. And then I recommend my podcast, Of course. That's my next question. Where can people find you? (laughs) Yeah. So I host a podcast called Pleasurable Money. I'm on Instagram at sacrednumbers.co. And I have a freebie right now called the Erotic Money Playbook. And if you download that, I'll walk you through casting your vision statement. We talk about pleasure and money. We talk about scarcity Oh, uh, yeah. embodiment and integration. It's a really great resource to have. Yeah. Amazing. Perfect. And for those of you listening, um, don't feel like you need to write anything down per usual. These links and resources are going to be in the show notes and on the YouTube channel, same thing in the show notes, you guys, you can just look below and find them. Um, but I really want to thank you so much for your time. Time is valuable. So you giving it to me and everybody is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Jess. Yeah, girl.